Good evening. It is 6 p.m. on Wednesday. We are at Jesus' Lord Ministries, located six miles outside of Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. This is our third meeting, our third gathering today. The Lord says we should gather as people, and we do three times every day, seven days a week since April 10th. Father, I I thank you that we have the opportunity to gather in the name of Jesus and that this ministry gathers three times each day at 10 a.m., 2 p.m., and 6 p.m. in obedience to the knowledge that we learn from the Holy Bible of God our Father and our Lord Jesus. So as I speak these messages, these scriptures the holy scriptures that you gave to me, that you put on my heart, I thank you that they will not return void. And Father, I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ to be quickened by the scriptures we hear today, that we may hide them in our heart that we don't sin against you, that we get the revelation of the love of Christ, that we may know him. And I know that's your will for us, for we were created in your image to be conformed after your likeness. And we see that in Jesus. So I thank you for listening to this prayer request. And I thank you now for answering it. I ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. We are talking about the love of God. God is love. That is His very nature. He is love. And Jesus is the express image of the Father. He's the same of the Father. Jesus said, if you see me, you see the Father. So I'm going to give you a few scriptures to open, and then what what I'd like you to do is listen to these scriptures as a lead-in, but open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. Now, Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, and in chapter 3, verse 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. I'm going to repeat that. The excellency. What is the excellency Paul's writing about? Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, all things but loss, for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. Christ is the express image of the Father. He is God, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. That means God is love, Jesus is love, because Jesus is God. Now, we spent some time in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and Paul, by inspiration of God, listed what I would be bold enough to say are many of the things that the saints in the body of Christ seek after. And yet he said, none of these things matter but love. If he did any of them, or all of them, he said, without love, I would be nothing. Without love, he would be nothing. So, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And now verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. 
And then, ye are my friends, if ye do whatever so, I command you. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 2, verse 49, I must be about my Father's business. And then he told his disciples, if you're a disciple of Christ, he said, follow me. Now what is that suffering? It's to crucify your flesh. It's the old man that we talked about at 2 o'clock today. The old person has to die. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us by the washing of regeneration. That was your rebirth and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. That's the conforming. Remember, it's a renovation. That word meant renovation. You're a renovation project in Christ, and you can't do that without knowledge of Him, without knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we have to do all things that Christ commanded us, in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verse 1 through 11, Jesus gives us an allegory called the true vine. And he's going to give us the process that we have to follow, what we have to do to get there. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes it away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have given unto you. It's the word. As the branch cannot bear fruit unless it abides in the vine, no more can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me... You can do nothing. Without that knowledge of Christ Jesus, you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, he will be cast forth as a branch and is withered. Men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. It's because you're being conformed into Him, so your will is going to mirror His will, and you are going to ask the things that you see in the Bible that you should become, like Him. Knowledge, Grace and peace be multiplied unto me in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus for the spirit, the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are all prayers that Paul and Peter prayed for the saints. They were given by inspiration of God. I pray those over myself and my family, my wife, every day before I leave the house. And those prayers get answered every day. Because I meditate on God's words. And He teaches me. He is going to conform us to the extent that we allow Him to into His image. Now, in the book of Acts, in chapter 20, Paul called the elders, gathered them together, and he told them that he did not shun, he didn't hold back to give them the whole counsel of God. He did not just preach that God is love, God is good, God is merciful. He gave them the wrath of God, the testimonies, the judgments of God. And he said, no man's blood is on my hands, for I did not hesitate to give you the whole counsel of God. So as we go through 1 John, we are going to see that John, John got that revelation and he is going to give us the whole counsel of God. You're going to see the consequences 
either for or against how you can allow yourself to be conformed into the image of Jesus. And this is from the apostle that Jesus said he loved. Now, if we go to chapter 1, I'm going to start in verse 1. We're going to go through this, and I'm going to give you commentary. This is a very... The Gospel of John... The Gospel of John is different than what we call the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They, they have scriptures that mirror one another. Most of those categories were, were hearing the words of Christ. If you have a red letter edition, John's Gospel was written, I would say, at least 25 years after those. And these three epistles, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, were all written within the same time frame. And then he wrote the book of Revelation. Now the very first sentence in Revelation starts out, the revelation of Jesus Christ. So who had that revelation? John did. And we're going to look at his letter to the church. I believe this is a circular letter to the church. It doesn't have who it's going to, written in it. There's no person's name, no place's name. You know, my own belief is because letters had to be hand-delivered that he would have give this letter to an emissary of his with a, a verbal greeting and said, give this greeting to the church. When I go to Africa, when I go into the mission field, if some of those pastors can't be there that's what they do they send somebody to that service and they'll get up briefly and say you know pastor david chuma couldn't make it and he wanted to, he extends his love to his family his brethren here in mazabuka uh, so they th that's a real it's a real uh concept it's a real practice that people do and you know when you go into the african bush there's not all the technology that we have here in America. So people still, people have, people have probably better communication skills there. You know, I used to teach a communications class and you don't hear that anymore. The Bible says we should be quick to listen and slow to speak. Most people always wanna speak. That's communication. The world understood that in those classes that they needed to listen to be able to apprehend what the message was, and then they had to be a doer of the word. So open your Bible up. This epistle is broken down into many topics, but it all flows uh, very neatly. I mean, God orchestrated it. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, which means conviction, for correction and instruction in righteousness until we all come into the perfect knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get away from that. You need to know God, not just his name. You have to have a personal relationship with him, and you're going to see that right in the first paragraph of 1 John because you're going to have some words that we give as a word that that I did as a word study and you'll see that. So in the Gospel of John chapter 17 verse 3, Jesus was praying to his father and he said, "Father, and this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent." So when I gave my confession of faith, when I heard the gospel, the whole gospel, the message, and I responded to it when I believed it in my heart and I confessed it out loud with my mouth, that was God's gift of salvation that's available to all. But I had to hear something and I heard knowledge of the gospel. The gospel is Jesus. Now I have to know him. That's where you have to work out your salvation with the fear and trembling of the Lord. Work it out. It was a gift given to you for you to be, for me to be in a perfect relationship 
with God the way that He created us to be. John understood that. So let's take a look at this line by line. If you look at the first four verses, if you're taking notes, write down what was heard, seen, and touched. He's an eyewitness. He touched Christ. Remember, he put his head in Christ's bosom at what we call the Last Supper. He chose to do that, and he was the only disciple, he was the only one of the original twelve at the crucifixion. And when Jesus was ready to give up the ghost, he looked down and he said to his mother, this is your son. And to John, he said, this is your mother. And John took care of her. That's how close he was to Jesus. Now, how many of us would take a parent or a child, a loved one, and give them to the care of someone else. I know I wouldn't do that. I don't. I, I don't. I don't trust the the. I trust the Christ that I see in people. That's what I trust. And Jesus said, "This is your mother, and this is your son." And he took that. Jesus said, "You are my friends if you do whatever I command you." And he, he said that. He didn't ask John to do that. He told him. And John took care of his mother. The woman that had the immaculate conception. So let's see what John writes. Now I want you to pay attention and listen. You can go back and study this. I'm going to give you commentary as we go. But John was close to Jesus. When I leave my house in the morning and I have my hour and a half to two hour commute, when I'm meditating on Christ, that's when the glory of God comes and that's when the divine downloads come. That's when I hear him answer my questions. It's because he's right there, but I did what he said to do in John 15. If you abide in me and I in you, Abide means dwell in an intimate place. So John wrote that by inspiration of God, and now let's see what he says in this epistle. What does God say speak to John's heart that he writes? Verse 1, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the Word of Life. Word with a capital W. In the beginning was the Word. John walked with the Word for three to three and a half years. The Word of Life. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. So he refers to Him as the Word of Life. The life was manifested. The Word was manifested. And the Word was made flesh. So these four verses are going to mirror the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you. Notice he says we, plural. The Jewish people needed two witnesses for it to be a witness. We have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life. God's sentence structure, that eternal life. He's talking about Christ, which was with the Father... See, that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Now, verse 3. We're only in the third verse of five chapters. So he's bearing witness of the reality of Christ. He was with him. He's an eyewitness. And he, he was close enough to touch him. That which we have seen and heard... We declare to you. 
Now he's going to tell us why in a minute. But he says, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. If I would go back into the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 18, no man has seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom, and that means in the heart, in the deepest affection of the Father, in the love of the Father, He has declared Him. The Word of life declared the Father. So Jesus told the disciples, follow me. Do what I tell you and you will be my friends. We're going to see why he says that in the Gospel of John in the next two verses. And John's repeating what he has to do, what he learned from Christ. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you. He saw the word in the flesh. The word of life in the flesh, God in the flesh. And now he's declaring that to us. And why does he do that? That you also may have fellowship with us. Fellowship. Now I'm going to give you the definition of that word. This epistle was written in, the, in Greek, so it had to be translated and the Greek language is much more, it's much deeper in, in, than our language. It actually will give you, if you would look up fellowship in the concordance, it will give you all the different contexts that that word can be used in. Now in this context, this is what he's saying. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us, that you may also have partnership with us, that you may also have participation with us, that you may also have social intercourse with us, that you may also communicate with us and to us, that you may be in a contribution of a relationship with us. That's what that word means. It doesn't mean that we are to be locked up in our house. Now there's people watching by modern technology tonight. Some of them can't get here for various reasons. But God, who is love, would love to heal your body and have you gather in his house as his word says. And if you can get to a church and you're not gathering, then I would ask the Lord tonight to inspire you to gather so that you're in the will of God. Be in fellowship with us. Come to this church. Come to our 10 a.m. service when there's a lot of people here and fellowship, communicate with us, commune with us. That's what that means, communion, fellowship, be in communion with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. So as a member as a leader in the church, and some were given apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, my job is to teach the Word of God, to edify the body of Christ, to lift them up through the Word of God till we all come into the knowledge of God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So if I'm not teaching or preaching, on Jesus Christ, I'm not doing what I'm called to do by God. And I have to give you the whole counsel of God. And that's what we're hearing here with John. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. That's verse 4. Now when I quoted those first eight verses in the Gospel of John, chapter 15, Verse 9 and 10, Jesus said, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. 
If you keep my commandments, you will dwell in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and dwell in his love. And then in verse 11, he says, These things have I said to you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy may become full. Those were Jesus' words, and now an apostle of Jesus Christ is giving us that same message. The message hasn't changed that John is giving us. He's giving us the message that Jesus gave to him. If you keep my commandments, you will dwell in my love. He is love. Only love is going to dwell there. You are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Friends, fellowship, friends are in fellowship. They don't stay away. Now he's going to talk about in the next six verses, he's going to talk about and expound on fellowship with him, with Christ, and one another. Now, why is he doing all this? We've spent a lot of time looking at the great commandment. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. They're linked together. Then we went through 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and we saw without love, we are nothing. We're nothing. In the Gospel of Luke, in chapter 12, Luke gives us by inspiration of God the Good Samaritan. The question that is asked in Matthew is, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? The question that Jesus is asked that we see recorded in Mark is, which is the great commandment in the law? And then the question that Jesus is asked in Luke is, Master, what do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus gives the great commandment first, and then he gives the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, why would he do that? It flows right into one another, because to love your neighbor out of love, you will do what the Good Samaritan does, in that parable, in that example, in that allegory, in that set of scriptures. Fellowship with Christ and one another. Now John said that his fellowship was with the Father and with Jesus Christ above. But he wants us to be in fellowship with him. And now he's going to give us, he's going to expound this. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. John heard this message and now he's declaring it to you. Jesus said, I only speak the words the Father gave to me and then he told us to follow him. So John is participating in the Great Commission. This is what we are all to do. That God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. God is a spirit, there's no flesh in God. God is light, there's no darkness in God. And God is love. If we say that we have fellowship, if we have partnership with Christ, participation with Him, social intercourse with Him, communication with Him, communion with Him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another so you could say, but if I walk 
in the love because I have fellowship with him who is love and he said follow me we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin if we say that we have no sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The definition of righteousness is equity of character, Christ's character, his personality, his qualities, and the deeds that he did. So unrighteousness would be not Jesus-like. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the truth. He's the light. He is love. Now, before we get into chapter 2, I want to take some time and give you a testimony because we overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies. Now, at 2 o'clock, I gave you the testimony of my mom, Mildred Yanata's salvation, how I had asked God to use me because she lived far away and I, I, I wanted to know, not from someone else, that she received God's gift of salvation before I came back home. And my dad lived in Scottsdale, Arizona. And he did not know the Lord. So when I gave my heart to Jesus, I was 57 years old. My dad was almost 80. But I had an encounter with Jesus. I had three of them with him. So there wasn't anybody that could ever tell me he was not real. So... I got the reality, the revelation of the condition of the heart of my mom and dad. They were not in communion with Christ. They did not know him. They did not know the Father. That meant they were under God's wrath and they were damned. God's will is for all to come to repentance, but many, most will not. My dad was under the wrath of God. Now, he knew me for 57 years. And I'm not going to give you my testimony in this message, but I, there was a people group that I persecuted, much like Paul did, until I had my encounter with Christ, and I, I, had a, I, 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 I repented. But I saw Jesus hanging on the cross one day. I knew that I was a sinner, and I knew my dad was going to go to hell if he died. Now, he got cancer. My family is all in the medical profession, so he had gone, he got tested, he got evaluated, he was told that he had to have chemotherapy, and he did that, but the cancer, for lack of a better, I, I don't remember the medical terms, but in layman's terms, it morphed into a different strain, so the chemotherapy that he got wasn't going to eradicate the cancer that he had, but nobody knew that. The doctors didn't know that. And at his age, he wasn't going to be able to go get any other treatment. So my sister calls me up one day, and I, I live in Pennsylvania, and she says, you need to come out and see Dad. He's really going downhill, and he's not going to make it that long. However, I said to her, I'll pray about it. And I heard the Lord put on my heart, this was in the beginning of August, he said September. And I told that to my sister, who's a nurse practitioner, 
and that went over like a lead balloon. She said, how can you do that? God won't, Dad's not going to live that long. And when she came up for air long enough to let me speak, I said, because God told me. And she didn't know how to respond to that, so she just didn't say anything else. We got off the phone. It gets to September, and I heard him tell me when to go. I kept think. I kept feel. This is important. I kept feeling like I had to go get a plane ticket and go to Arizona, and that unction got stronger and stronger. And finally, I asked the Lord, "Are you trying to get me to go to Arizona?" Now I asked Him to use me to give my dad the message, the gospel message. And God didn't answer me. Well, he already did before, and I wasn't hearing him. I wasn't paying attention. And finally, because I was busy, I said, are you going to tell me that if I go out there now, my dad's going to receive your gift of salvation? And he said, yes. So there was no way I wasn't going to go. So I got on a plane, I flew out there, and I get in my dad's house, And this man, John Wayne, was my dad's hero. And he didn't know the Lord, but he raised me through those John Wayne movies. And he was the strongest human being my dad was that I'd ever known in my life. And when I got there and we were having dinner, I was looking at him and he had oxygen on. He had a walker the kind where you can also sit in. And I'm looking at him thinking, my God, life's taken its toll on him. I mean, he was worn out. And after dinner, his future wife and her son got up. They went into the kitchen, and my dad looked at me and said, Peter, I'm ready to go home to my maker. And righteous anger rose up in me because he wouldn't let me witness to him. Every now and then he'd ask me a question and then he'd stop the conversation. And I stood up and slammed my fist on the dinner table and pointed at him and I said, no, you're not. I said, heaven and hell are real. And if you died right now, you'd be in the pit of hell. And we never see each other again. And I was shocked because he looked at me and said, what do I need to do? Now, I just got done reading not long before that in the book of Acts when they came out on the day of Pentecost and Peter preached to those 3,000 people. They were convicted, and that's what they said. What do we need to do? And he gave them the gospel, (laughs) and 3,000 got saved. So that's coming through my head. And I said to him, you need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ You need to believe it in your heart, and you need to confess it out loud. And he said, what's that? Now, my dad, when he had his own business, his employees called him bull for two reasons, because of his physical strength and his bullheadedness. And I said, are you willing to listen? Because you got to hear it. And he looked at me humbly, and he said, yes. And I went through the longest, I spent over an hour giving him the gospel because I didn't want anything to be in his way. He was either going to receive it or not receive it that day, but either way, I was gonna, there was going to be no gray area in my mind. So why, why would this all happen? It's because of what John wrote in these first ten chapters. I'm communion, in communion with Christ. I want Him. I want to seek Him through His Word. And the closer I get, the more I start to travail for people, cry out for their souls, lay hands on the sick and they get healed. It's because it's not us. We have to, we have to look and get to a place of love where God can come out of us, and He is love. That's how they get healed. 
So he heard the gospel. And about 10 minutes into it, his future wife, Arlene, comes over and says, I've been going to church all my life. I've never heard that. She said, can I sit down and listen to what you're saying? And then five minutes after that, her son Randy came over and he sat down. So now there's church. There's three people. God sent me for one. And why was that timing? It's important to be in his timing. He wasn't going to bring one into the kingdom. He was bringing three in. When I got done, I said to my dad, do you believe that? And he didn't answer me. And I said, well, I'm going to say some things, and I want you to listen to me, and then I'm going to ask you to repeat them with me. But you have to believe them in your heart. You have to believe it. So I, I prayed what he would, and, and what I believe, what I was taught he would need to admit. And when I got done, I looked at him and I said, are you ready to do that? And he said, no. And I said, fair enough, because you've got to believe it in your heart and confess it out loud. Now, I didn't ask him. What I asked him is, are you ready to do that? I didn't ask him if you believed it. He said he believed the gospel already. So a couple minutes go by, and my sister comes, picks me up to bring me to the airport. I fly back here, and a week later, I called him up. And I'm listening to him on the phone, and he's at peace. Now, when they told him there was nothing else they could do after the chemotherapy, he was full of hatred and bitterness. I mean, his bitterness towards that doctor and the medical profession turned into hatred. So what happened to him? Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. He was reborn. Now the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And that word renewing meant renovation. I talked about that this afternoon. We're renovation projects for Christ demolition projects. He's got to break us down into a contrite and humble spirit that he can build us back up. But when I called him that Sunday, and I, I spoke to him every Sunday, prior to that, he would use the Lord's name in vain. He was that angry. Every other word out of his mouth, he was using that. But he was at peace, and I'm listening to him at peace talk about his week. And then I heard him say, and G, and then he stopped and he looked at, he said, I don't think I'm supposed to say that that way anymore. And I said, no, you're not. And I said, look, Dad, I said, I prayed for you every day for years, and if you ever make that commitment in your heart, you need to let me know so I can stop praying about you. And he said, oh, I did. He said, when you left the house with Doreen, he said, I didn't do it because Randy and Arlene did it with <laughs> We all did it. So they all, they, three of them came into the kingdom that day. Now, he was given a year to a year and a half to live with the cancer. But he had bitterness and unforgiveness in his heart, not just for that doctor, but for family members. I mean, he had a long list of those. And we're not going to go into the kingdom of God. We can't be in communion with Christ, abiding in him, who's the express image of the Father, without, with unforgiveness in us. So he got worse. But he started to read the Bible. I, get, I brought him a Bible that night. And all of a sudden, he started to call me and ask me questions. So I knew he was reading. He put down all his hunting magazines, all the books, the Western books he read. 
He stopped watching the Western movies, and he just read the Bible. The renewing by the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of Truth. So now, he has the Spirit of Christ in him, and he's reading the Bible earnestly in Spirit and Truth. And he felt better, he sounded better. So I asked him one day, I said, Dad, do you want to live? And he, he, he said, you know, yeah, I do. Now that night before, when he gave his heart to the Lord, he was worn out and he was, he was done. And I heard the Lord tell me, he put on my heart when to go out there. And he said to me, you give him the words so he can receive the scriptures on healing and bring Sherry, that's my wife. Now Sherry has amazing testimonies. She is, she's 68 right now and she has the heart of a 20 year old athlete because they wanted to take, they wanted to give her a heart transplant and told her she wouldn't live and she refused that and God gave her a new heart. So he told me, bring her with you, and she has the medical evidence. She has the imaging of the old heart and the new heart, and you can clearly see from the records it's the same person, same identity. So I didn't call her up and tell her that because I learned a long time ago, years, several years ago, not a long time, that they have to hear from God Two. So I'm not going to go up to her and say, by the way, you need to come to Phoenix with me. Now, I had already bought my ticket. But when I got home that night and we ate dinner, she looked at me and said, would you pray about something for me? And I said, what's that? And she said, could you please pray and see? I know that when you go to visit your dad, it's a personal thing and you haven't seen him for a while. But I, I, I'm starting to feel like I'm supposed to go with you. <laughs> there was the confirmation. So I said to her, you are, go ahead and, and get your ticket. So she was able to get, now that plane was filling up quick. And guess where her seat was on the plane? It was right next to me. So I told her what to bring with her and what the Lord told me to do. I said, when we get there, and the rest of the family is gone because the unbelief can't be there. I said, I will ask Dad again. I, I mean, the Lord didn't tell me to do this, but I said, I'm going to ask him if he wants to live. And if he does, I'm going to tell him he can be healed because he is healed. He just has to believe it. And when I get done speaking or I get to a certain part, the Lord's going to let me know, and then you, you're going to give him the, your testimony and then we'll go lay hands on him and if, if if he if he if he's ready which i believe he is the lord is going to heal him so we get there we had dinner i sat there with him and and i gave him healing scriptures i talked about christ what he wants for us, this life. Remember the word of life John talked about? Eternal life, the word of life, Zoe life here in earth as it is in heaven. And it was the scriptures after scriptures. Now, again, his future wife is in the kitchen and her phone's ringing and she's texting people. And my dad finally raises his voice and says, would you please turn that off? I'm trying to hear this and he's leaning forward in his chair I mean he wanted to seek Jesus he was ready like Paul said in the book of Acts when he saw that crippled person on the ground I perceived he was ready to receive healing and then Sherry gave the testimony and I said dad do you want do you do you believe do you believe the words you heard? And he said, yes. He just confessed that. And I asked him, do you believe Jesus Christ can heal you right now? And he said, yes. So there was the confession by mouth. 
just like we got our salvation. God's mercy got salvation, and now grace. So we walked over to him and put our hands on him and just prayed briefly, and my body got hot, and tears were streaming down my face. That's the manifestation of how God's glory comes upon me with Sherry, she shakes. So she was shaking some, and uh, we just said, be healed in Jesus' name, and he said he believed he was healed. So when we left, he called me several days after that, and he said, I need to ask you a question. He said, "When, when you and Sherry had your hands on me, He said, something was happening. I said, it's the healing of God, the glory, the power of God, the fire of God. And he said, yeah, I don't mean when Sherry was shaking, not that. Something came into my body. And I said, that's what that was, Dad. You got healed. Now, he had no more symptoms from that day forward of that cancer. And I wanted to tell him, Dad, you need to make your relationship with with Arlene right. Because living in sin, in the book of Galatians and in Romans, we're not going to enter into the kingdom of God whether we made that commitment or not. Andy had unforgiveness in him. God kept him alive for six years. He read his Bible I started to talk to him one day about unforgiveness, and he said, you know, Peter, I forgave Uncle Billy. He said, I called everybody that I had problems with, and I forgave them all. And we had wonderful conversations. And I kept asking him. I kept wanting to send him scriptures from Galatians, and the Lord kept telling me, no, no. So I waited for six years in faith, that he was going to enter into the kingdom because God kept him alive that long for him to forgive those that he needed to forgive and he was going to have to marry somebody or that relationship wasn't going to be able to continue like it was. So my sister calls me one day. This is the love of God. When we're... When we are working, operating in the kingdom of God, and we ask Him for His timing, and we're in perfect peace, we should be trusting Him then, not tormented. So everybody else is upset, and I was in peace. And she called me one day, and she said, You, now I'm the oldest of three siblings, and my sister's the youngest, She said, you and David and I are going to have to split the cost of dad's, you know, this care that he was getting. He got healed of the cancer, but he he, he needed physical therapy and, and other things. And I said to her, I'm not going to do that. And she got upset with me. And I said... And she went through this long list of why there were no other options. And when she got done, I said, Are there no, is there nothing else? And she said, no. And then I said this to her. I said, there's, there's got to be something else. And she said, well, there's one other thing. Because dad's a veteran, if he would marry Arlene and put the house in her name, the state of Arizona would pay his the bills that he had, (laughs) and he wouldn't have any of that cost. But he had to do it in his heart. A couple days had gone by and he called me up. Now he had told me, I think they lived together for 25 or 30 years. He would always tell me Arlene is the best woman that I've ever known in my life. But see, he hung on to the bitterness when my mom divorced him, and he swore he'd never get married again. 
So he clung on to that. But what was God doing? Renewing by the Holy Spirit. The renewing of the washing of the water of word. He was bringing him closer into his image. And then he said to me one day, he said, Peter, would you get upset if I married Arlene? And I said, no, I'd be happy for you. And he said, I really... I really want to do this in my heart. It's the right thing to do. He said, I should have done it a long time ago. And then he asked me if I'd be upset if he put the house in her name. And I said, Dad, it's your last will and testament. The house doesn't mean anything to me. It's a thing. So they got married. They got to spend one year together after that as a married couple. Arlene's countenance changed because the relationship was made right and she was no more going to feel like a second-rate citizen, something was wrong with her, that he couldn't marry her. And then he he went home to the Lord. The family convinced him to have radiation. He went and did that, and that was it. They were going to put him on hospice, give him morphine, and Arlene called me. Now, my sister had power of attorney over my parents, and she called me one day and said, Peter, is it wrong for me to pray for the Lord to take your dad home before all this stuff happens? I don't want to see him go through that with the morphine. Now, she knew my mom. They became friends several decades after they were divorced, and she saw my mom on morphine. And I said no. And within two days, my dad peaceably went home with the Lord. So how many people are out there, loved ones that we have, but we're so focused on what we think, what what we declare that we don't have that we want from God, the stuff of this world, the clutter of this world. God said if you're at enmity you're at enmity with him if you're in love with the world and we're supposed to love him. How many people out there have loved ones that drift into eternity? Many of them probably go to hell because we didn't, we didn't commune with Christ and do what he told us to do and love one another enough to pray for them and for God to make a way. Because as I spoke at 2 o'clock, my mom had a damaged brain, and he opened her brain up to receive Christ. And he kept my dad alive for six, seven years until his heart got right with him, with God, and then he took him home. All the unforgiveness was gone. The fornication was gone. The lifestyle, it was all gone, and my dad devoted those years where God healed him to abide in Christ, that he abided in him. And I'll close on that. Father, I thank you for your words of truth from the word of life. And as your servant John said, that we're to commune in fellowship, not just with one another, but We do that through our relationship in God the Father and our Lord Jesus. So I ask, Lord, that this message and this testimony, like your word says in the book of Acts, pricks all of us in the heart to move us to want to seek your face that we can be vessels used by you that the loved ones that we have won't be lost, that none of them are lost. And I ask you to quicken this message to us by your Spirit, the Spirit of truth, and motivate us. Move us by your Spirit, Lord. We submit to you. We surrender. We ask for a contrite and humble spirit because you said you would revive the spirit of the humble, and the hearts of the contrite ones. So we ask you to revive our hearts, resuscitate our hearts, to want to pray for those that are lost.
that we travail for the lost because those are the prayers that reach up to heaven that get answered immediately. When we believe that in faith, and I thank you for, I thank you for that reality, that it's faith, hope, and love. But love is the, the love is without love, it's nothing. All things are dung. So inspire us. Give us a divine hunger and thirst to pursue after your righteousness. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.